بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم والصلاة والسلام على سيدنا محمد وعلى آله وصحبه وسلم تسليما كثيرا ولا حول ولا قوة إلا بالله العلي العظيم الحمد لله اللهم افتح علينا حكمتك وانشر علينا رحمتك يا ذا الجلال والإكرام وصل لهم على سيدنا محمد وعلى آله الكرام ولا حول ولا قوة إلا بالله العلي العظيم الحمد لله so Bismillah. So this is the third chapter, and uh, this is uh, uh, this concerns what a lot of popular misconceptions about knowledge. Uh, what's from knowledge, praiseworthy knowledge, but is actually not from it. And then in what way are some of the Islamic sciences negative and some uh, uh, blameworthy. And then he talks about the problem of mustarahat or technical terms, the problem of uh, words that we use and we misunderstand their original intent in the Quran. And, and he goes through, uh, which is a very important point. And he talks about fiqh, about jurisprudence, the meaning of fiqh, that we define it as jurisprudence, the meaning of ilm, how we define knowledge itself, tawheed, the unity, tadkir, which is uh, uh, exhortation, hikmah, which is wisdom, and then also what is the degree of knowledge, that, of shar'i knowledge, which is praiseworthy, and then when does it enter into the blameworthy? Because he argues that too much knowledge in certain areas becomes blameworthy. Now he begins the chapter, and this is important. Knowledge, knowledge is the ma'rifa, which is another word. It's it. It has the idea of correct or sound belief or sound understanding of a thing in accordance with what it actually is. So this is this is traditionally our scholars believed in what's now known as the correspondence theory of truth. That truth is what corresponds to reality. If it doesn't correspond to reality, it's not true. Part of the modern problem is that they no longer accept certain epistemological uh, understandings that were accepted uh, in the pre-modern world. And what I mean by that is Epistemology is, 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 is the science that studies how we know things and whether that knowledge is sound or unsound. And so the, the, the epistemological premise of the Muslims was that the mind and, and, and the phenomenal world are actually, uh, they work uh, in a way that enables us to know that what, what we understand and what we conceive of the world is true. Um, so, the uh, in, in the Mus in, uh, in our tradition, uh, you had you had uh, fawail. And, and, and these, are, these are what correspond in the West to what are known as virtues. Virtue has been replaced with, in, in, in today's world, with uh, another, an, another word, which are values. It's actually an economic term, Wert in German. It came from Max Weber and Durkheim, and the, the, these uh, sociologists introduced this idea. But prior to that, people understood uh, virtues because values are relative, right? Values are relative, whereas virtue is, it's, it's not a relative concept. Courage as a virtue should be a universal. And so this is the idea, this gets back again to a different epistemology. Modern people tend to see uh, values as relative, and so, for instance, in Turkey they might do certain things as a culture, that's their culture, but those things aren't applicable somewhere else in terms of behaviors and standards. Whereas from the Abrahamic tradition, there's a belief actually that fitrah 
the, the, the aboriginal nature or the primordial nature of the human being aligns with certain virtues. And, and in a healthy society, those virtues are going to be inculcated. In a society that has been perverted, those, 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 those are also going to show signs of perversion. And so traditionally, they understood this as, as having uh, the moral virtues uh, and then the intellectual virtues. and then the religious or spiritual virtues. So each, each one of these corresponds to the moral virtues, correspond to the, the two, the two uh, powers in the human being, which are the, the ghadabiyya and the shahwaniya. So the, the irascible and the concusable souls. And, and, and the moral virtues regulate this. But when you get into the intellectual virtues, these regulate the, 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 the intelligence or the intellect. And they need to be Cultivated, the virtues need to be cultivated, and so the the, the first one is is understanding. Understanding is natural to the human being, and 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 the, the science that that really regulates understanding is. Uh, your understanding is, is, is it's an intuitive knowledge. It's something that you simply grasp. So this is idrak. It's, it's the fahm or idrak that a human being knows, for instance, that uh, two is greater than one. It's a first principle. You, you, can't, you can't teach that to somebody. It's something that is grasped and understood or it's not. But you can't actually teach somebody. Even children understand stand that. It's an, it's an intuitive. So this is the intuitive uh, quality. And, 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 and the second one is, is uh, science, which we call ilm. Now, ilm is what he's talking about. It's what corresponds with reality. But this second virtue... The, the identification of it as a virtue is that it can be taught. In other words, if you can teach it, it's a science. The first one, understanding, you can't teach it. That's its defining quality or characteristic. You cannot teach it. It's grasped and it's understood intuitively. You simply know it. It's, it's, it's a ma'rifa that you have. You just know it. And that's why if somebody asks you, sometimes, you can't really explain that. Well, why is two greater than one? Well, you can see. Here's two and here's one. Can't you see that that's greater than that? You, you can't explain it. Why? It's simply, it's, it's reality and, and it's understood. It's grasped. So the science, though, is mathematics. So I, mm -hmm. I was going to say, on certain types of understanding, you come to them once you've been taught certain things. So you can well, no, exactly. It's cultivated. So, yeah. Understanding is cultivated, and as you move up, understanding gets more and more rarefied. But this is a basic, th these, are, these are things that are inherent in us that need to be cultivated, right? And that's why, for instance, it, when you get into logic, one of the things that logic teaches you is how to define things. And the definition is based on the understanding. You, you can't define a thing without grasping what, what it is, right? So, so the definition is related to the understanding. But you, you learn it, you acquire it. These are things that are acquired. But they're based on, this is first principles, that you understand first principles. So one of the things about understanding, is there any doubt about God? It's something that you simply understand. And that's why it's a fitra belief. It's a fitra belief. 
Uh, children do not have a problem with God. In fact, you can teach them uh, a lot of different religious beliefs. They don't have a they don't have a difficulty grasping angels, grasping, and you can tell them things that aren't real, also, obviously. But their fitra is to, to accept that there is something beyond uh, this world. They also, by nature, understand causation, children. In fact, Fakhruddin al Razi says, if you want to know, if you want to see that causation is, is the fitra of the human being, then he said, get a little child that isn't yet walking and hide somewhere and then throw something in front of it, like a ball or a rock or something. And the child will turn and look and try to find the source. He said, if they simply thought that things could just pop into existence, it wouldn't have a problem just seeing a ball pop into existence. But it's the fitra to look for causation. And that's why it's totally anti-fitra that this thing could have popped into existence. It's completely against the fitra of the human being to believe that this universe could have simply just popped into existence without any murajjah, without any force that brought it into existence. Um, and so that, th those are first principles. And then science, are, so these sciences, uh, I mean, obviously there, there are, there are, um, uh, these, these are the theoretical, these are what they call the speculative nadhariya. And then you have the amriya. When you get into the amriya, you have the, the virtues that are, they're, they're virtues of, uh, of, of prudence. And then there's virtues of sina'a. Because sina'a, art and, 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 uh, and prudence are the, the practical virtues of the intellect. And the art is what enables you to, to make things, to do things. And, and, and then the, the, uh, the phronesis or the prudence, what, what was called hikmah. The Arabs didn't differentiate between uh, virtue, wisdom, sophia, and phronesis. They, they didn't differentiate between those. Whereas in the, uh, in the Greek tradition, they differentiate between them. In, the, in our tradition, they called them both hikmah. So they put hikmah as a moral virtue and hikmah as an intellectual virtue. As an intellectual virtue, uh, you, 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 you have it in, in both the speculative and the pra practical. So the third one is wisdom. And wisdom, this is hikmah, and he's gonna talk about it. Hikmah is, uh, hikmah is when these two work together. When your understanding and your, your, your acquired knowledge are working together in a healthy way, you will tend to do the right thing or have the right understanding about it. And so hikmah as a theoretical and a practical will work best at that point. And with, with the practical virtues, the arts, the sina'a, and they called nahwa sina'a. The, the art of grammar. You had the fine arts, the mechanical arts, and the liberal arts. So you had the funun, and then you had the sina'at, and then you had these ulum al-ala, and they all went under that. So what he's saying here is that if you say that knowledge is, corresponds with reality, and knowledge is an attribute of God, how then can a thing, if it's an attribute of God, knowledge is an attribute of God, how can it be blameworthy at the same time? If it's knowledge, how can you have blameworthy knowledge? He says, Knowledge is never blameworthy in and of itself. It's not blameworthy in and of itself. But it's blameworthy because of three reasons. The first one is that it leads to some harm. So the knowledge itself becomes harmful. For instance, sihr, magic, tilasmat, uh, or tilsamat, the talismanic magic. Uh, and he said, And this is a reality because the Quran has uh, testified to it. And it's a reason, it's a means by which you can affect a marital relationship. وَقَدْ سُحِرَ رَسُولُ اللَّهِ صَلَّى اللَّهِ عَلَيْهِ 
وَمَرِضَ بِسَبِبِهِ The Prophet ﷺ himself was put, uh, there, there were, uh, you know, the نَفَّاثَاتِ فِي الْعُقَادِ And they breathed 11 times onto it. 11 is one of their numbers, because they're very into numerology, and 11 is one of the numbers that you will find. Uh, uh, Alistair Crowley has a lot about 11 and the power of 11. So it's a very, uh, November is a very important month for them. Um, uh, and that's why Halloween, right, is on the, the cusp of the, of the, it's the end of the 10th month, on the, and, and the witching hour is actually moving into the 11th month. So when, when they did the, uh, they blew on the knots 11 times, so Allah gave the Prophet 11 verses to counter that magic. And so the Mu'awidatayn have, if you count them, there's 11 verses. And this counters the uh, magic out there. So magic, the magic is, uh, is a blameworthy knowledge, and people learn it. There are people that study it. Now in the West, it's spread. There, there's whole, if you go into the bookstore, there's all these books on magic, how to put spells on people, how to do things, uh, you know, t teaching people all of these occultic sciences and things like that. So, um, and trust me, you would be shocked at people involved in magic in our society. There's people that you, there are famous people heavily involved in this stuff. You would be amazed at who, who does this stuff. Uh, a lot of actors are heavily involved in it, uh, incantations, uh, musicians, and others. So what he says is, uh, Here's what he says, it, that magic, and this is important as a definition, magic is a type of knowledge that people learn the, the essences of things and, and what, what, what those essences can do. And that's why, in, in, uh, in reality, and this is what Arthur C. Clarke said, when you get into a higher technology, it becomes indistinguishable from magic. So a lot of, of what, what we're dealing with in this world these people would, would have looked at it as magic. The nuclear bomb is a magical device be, because it's understanding the khawas of jawahir. It's understanding the nature of essences, like what, the nature of the neutron and, and the power that can be unleashed. And how do you do it with, with these incantations, mathematical formulae that enable them? And this is, and you know, the, I understand uh, the problem with this, because there's, there's people who are going to say, well, this is knowledge. That's the whole point. It is knowledge. It is knowledge. That is the point. But what, why is it being used, and what is it used for? Because um, these things are extremely dangerous. Like, so, so this idea somehow that Muslims, uh, you know, this is a pre-modern or primitive idea, no. It's very real. These things are very real, learning these things. And this is why many of the scientists in the, in the, in the medieval and uh, in the late, uh, the Renaissance period and the Enlightenment period were involved heavily in magic. And you, you can study this in the history of it. They were very interested in alchemy. And, and all of these sciences came out of these occultic uh, sciences. So there's a relationship between uh, very, very sophisticated uh, sciences and magic. That, that's the point. And he said also be umuran hisabiya. So mathematical formulae. Fi matali an nujum. Dealing with as, also with uh, positions of planets. Fa yutakhdu min tirk al jawahir haykadun ala surat al shakhs al mashhur wa yuturasad lahu fi waqt al maqsus. They will also take images of a person and wait for specific times. And they'll, they'll learn incantations. And they will, uh, through this, gain uh, uh, help from the, uh, this demonic realm. وَيَحْصُرُ مِنْ مَجْمُوعِ ذَلِكَ بِحِكْمِ إِجْرَاءِ اللَّهِ تَعَلَى الْعَادَةِ بِحُكْمِ إِجْرَاءِ اللَّهِ تَعَلَى الْعَادَةِ And Allah, this is, this is an ada also. All right? So it's, it's something Allah has habituated things. And he said, from this will come أَحْوَالٌ غَرِيبُتٌ فِي الشَّخْصِ المسحور. Very strange things can come out of this. So there's, there's a lot of magic uh, going on, right? 
And, and, and uh, a lot of people are literally under what, you know, what I'm trying to say is that, because this is very, it's very difficult to, to understand this properly. What I'm trying to say is that there are a lot of what's happening today is in this realm. And it's very difficult for people to understand this. But when you study it, what you find is that, that the people that a lot of the people involved in mass uh, control are actually heavily involved in this science. And that, that's what you find out uh, when you do the research. Uh, many of the people that are involved in film, many of the people involved in music, many of the people that are uh, involved in uh, newscasting, they know how to manipulate uh, the minds of people. And whether it's done with this type of magic or simply with the power of technology and the higher magic, the result is the same. You get people that are uh, as if they're possessed. And this is why um, it would be indistinguishable. You know, we've got kids that are stabbing children. We've got people that are just shooting people and not knowing why they're doing these things. And this is coming out of a culture that is really, really uh, profoundly disturbed in its essence because no civilization that was healthy would produce the type of games that they're exposing these young children to. No civilization that, that was healthy would produce the type of films where they have films where the, 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 the main character tortures people and chops off their fingers and their hands uh, or, or slowly tortures them to death. They, they, they wouldn't, Muslims would have never come up with these type of uh, ideas because the, their, their culture is not a, it's, it's not a demonic, dark culture. It's become demonic and dark because uh, of a lot of madness that's happened in the Muslim world. I mean, there's a lot of demonic, dark things going on. And these people are really, uh, Dostoevsky called his book about the terrorists, The, the Possessed. And in one, um, in one translation, it's called The Demons. I don't know the Russian word for it. But he certainly understood that there was something demonic involved in this. So that's, you know, this is difficult for people to deal with this stuff, but when you actually find out about the characters that were involved in producing a lot of this technology and, and, and you read the history of it, you find that they were really involved in a lot of these things, which is very strange. And when you see the result that these things have on people and the effect uh, that they have on them. So, I mean, I don't know, that Arthur C. Clarke, who said that uh, advanced technology becomes indistinguishable from magic, was involved in magic. He was involved in numerology. Um, it's very strange that they place these satellites at 22,000 feet because those are their numbers, 11, 22, 33. They like multiples of 11 and things like this. So I don't know. I mean, we're all trying to work this thing out, aren't we? But uh, these things are real and jadu, whatever you want to call it, it's real. Uh, and, and, and that's why we, and I'll tell you something just uh, personally. For me, I didn't really give a lot of this credence because I wasn't raised like this. I was raised, I mean, my father was a college professor. Um, I, I certainly wasn't raised with the idea, like magic was something, you know, I thought magic was pulling rabbits out of hats and things like that. When, when I became Muslim and I heard all these things and, you know, I didn't really, whatever, you know, it wasn't really something, but in the last few years, it's become much clearer to me how much this is actually a force working in the world. And, and it makes much more sense to me now why there are so many hadiths and so many protective du'as against this stuff. You know, this is evil. And also, you know, the, these... The, the influences of the demons. You know, the Prophet said, or that they should become present. You know, so the demonic realm is real. And there are people, unfortunately, that are actively involved in attempting to bring that realm into this realm. And this is where it gets very strange. So, 
And they're certainly into numerology. It's a big thing with these people. So he's, he's warning us and saying that this is madhmum. So that's a harmful knowledge. The second reason he said is that that is harming other people. So the knowledge is used to harm other people, right? And people do this. Right? They just had a woman who got six years in England. She got fired. <laughs> fired her, so she started putting on internet to, to, that she had rape fantasy, she wanted somebody to come to her house and, and, and pretend to rape her, and, and she gave her boss's number who fired her, you know, I mean, it, there's a lot of sick people out there, right, and they're just, you know, you're working with people like that, we, we've got pedophiles, we've got um, rapists, we've got sociopaths, and these people are are demonic people, you know, that really, they're, they're, they're people that, and Imam al-Ghazali says that they've actually given the shayateen al-jinn a rest. Like they're doing so much work now, the shayateen al-ins, that the shayateen al-jinn are just taking, kicking back and watching it all happen. So there's a lot of demonic forces. Now, whatever, whatever you want to call this, if you want to call it magic or whatever you want to call it, these, these are terms for phenomena in the world. That's the point. And obviously it becomes very difficult because uh, uh, magic is totally haram in Islam. But Imam al-Ghazali will argue in the Ihya, in the Bab al-Safar, that delving too deeply into mathematics is prohibited. And I know a lot of people have problems with that, but if you look at a lot of what's happening on this planet that's so destructive, it's because of the, this knowledge that has come out. I mean, Muslims use mathematics for very positive things, like building buildings and uh, finding the Qibla and determining the prayer times. They would never have used it to build bombs that could annihilate whole populations. So now we have to deal with the fact that you know, the men that, that uh, invented the nuclear bomb were all, uh, you know, wizards, really. I mean, they were wizards. And, and some of them were involved in, in black magic. This is a, simply a fact. So, uh, so he says the second reason is that it harms uh, the person himself. And, and he says, like astrology. Um, learning astrology. And he said there's an aspect of astrology that, and because th these people did not distinguish between astrology and astronomy. So Ibn al Najum meant astronomy and astrology. Because every astrologer has to be an astronomer. You know, ast uh, astrology is based on the science of astronomy. You have to know where the planets are, you have to know what uh, constellation the moon is in, the sun is in, and this is, and this is all done through astronomy. So he's saying, Allah says, "Ashamsu wa al bi husban." We put the sun and the moon in a in a reckoning in reckoning reckoned courses that you can determine them. Wa al qamar qadarnahu manazira hatta adik al ujun al qadim. There are 28 manzira of the moon, so it, it throughout the month it will go into these uh, manazir. And then uh, the second are the ahkam, and he's saying this is. Uh, learning, he said, this is like a, 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 a doctor uses the pulse diagnosis, and Dr. Yang's an expert uh, in that pulse diagnosis. So he can determine from pulse diagnosis uh, illnesses. Um, Western medicine abandoned this type of pulse diagnosis, but the Chinese medicine, Ayurvedic medicine, traditional Greek medicine um, was heavily reliant on the diagnostic technique of pulse. So he says that astrology is akin to using the, the doctor who uses pulse diagnosis, that looking at the sunnah uh, that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has, because there's a relationship between comets, between 
phenomena. Like in, in, in the Christian tradition, Jesus, there was a comet that indicated uh, his coming. The prophet mentioned about certain celestial events that will happen before the end of time, the joining of the sun and the moon uh, in mid-month, which would only occur during a, uh, a, uh, a polar shift. And then, you know, because as, as the poles shift, you could get a, an eclipse at that time. And, and, then, and then you'll have uh, the sun rising in the west if you had a polar shift as well. So, Allahu alam. But the Prophet ﷺ said, إِذَا ذُكِرَ الْقَدَرْ فَأَمْسِكُوا if, if you mention uh, the qadar, just don't delve into it. فَأَمْسِكُوا Just believe in it and don't go delve into it. You have free will. You're accountable for your free will, but there's also qadr. And he said, وَإِذَا ذُكِرَتْ النُّجُومْ فَأَمْسِكُوا And if the stars are mentioned, just be quiet about it. And, and this is, there, there are three positions traditionally amongst the scholars about this science. Some of them said that astrology uh, is, it, all of them were in agreement that predictive astronomy, astrology is haram. They were all in agreement about that. But what they disagreed about was, was it a science or not? And uh, most of the ulama considered it to be a science, that it was a science. Some of them didn't, but most of them did. Uh, <coughs> Newton was a, a very serious astrologer. He was also a brilliant scientist. But somebody asked him, he asked Haley, who was the astronomer, um, he asked Haley, who Haley's Comet is named after, whether he believed in astrology or not. And he said, absolutely not. It's just hogwash. He said, have you ever studied it? And he said, no. He said, well, then how could you make a judgment like that? Because he said, I've studied it, and I don't think that it's hogwash. So, but our tradition is to avoid uh, those things. And he said, If my companions are mentioned, be silent. If you don't have something good to say, be silent about the Sahaba. Because they're his Sahaba. They, some of them made mistakes, undeniably but they were his sahaba, and so we're just silent about them, uh, the ones that uh, made the mistakes. قَالَ صَلَّى اللَّهُ عَلَيْهِ وَسَلَمْ أَخَابَ عَلَى أُمَّةِ بَعْدِ ثَلَاثِ حَيْفُ الْأَيْمَا وَإِيمَانٌ بِالنُّجُومِ وَتَكْذِيبٌ بِالْقَدَرِ I fear from my community three things after me. The tyranny of uh, the, its, its leaders, faith in uh, the stars, and denying the qadr. And Umar ibn al-Khattab said, learn from the stars what you guide yourselves by, and then amsiku, just don't delve into it, the stars. So that's a science that he considers um, to be uh, harmful, and you shouldn't study it. Uh, and then uh, he says, uh, um, And then he said that, that, you know, there's also things that are no benefit. So uh, learning, going too much, delving into something, uh, learning the strange things. Like there's people that learn strange aspects of grammar and they don't know basic grammar. There's people that learn strange things about fiqh and they don't know basic fiqh. So like people that before they learn fiqh, they learn ilm al-khilaf, things like that. Um, and so he says that's the third reason. So uh, and then um, he goes into uh, the problem with the technical vocabulary. So, for instance, he says there's five things, fiqh, ilm, tawheed, tadkir, and hikmah. And he said these have been, the meanings have been altered. He said if you look at fiqh, uh, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, لِيَتَفَقَّهُ فِي الدِّينِ وَلِيُنذِرُوا قَوْمُهُمْ إِذَا رَجَعُوا فِي فَلَوْ لَا نَفْرَ مِنْ كُلِّ فِرْقَةٍ مِنْهُمْ طَائِفَةٍ That when they go out to, to for military, uh, expeditions, a group should stay behind لِيَتَفَقَّهُ to understand their religion and he said, what do they do when they get back? They لِيُنذِرُوا قَوْمَهُمْ 
to warn their people when they get back. إِذَا رَجِعُوا He said, this is fiqh. It's, he said, this is not like the rules of talaq and itaq uh, and li'an and salam and ijara. He's saying, this, they're not warning them, oh, woe unto you, divorce is three times, woe unto you. Right? He's saying, no, this is a spiritual knowledge so that they're able to have an impact on these people when they come back. And then Allah says, لَهُمْ قُلُوبًا لَا يَفْقَهُونَ بِهَا They have hearts, but they don't, have, they don't understand with them. He said he's not talking about fatawa. He's talking about iman, that they don't believe with them. And so he said it's a problem that fiqh uh, has become associated solely with jurisprudence. And... Uh, And when a group came to the Prophet, he said, Ulama'u hukama'u fuqaha'u. And he said he was talking about their states. And then he said, somebody asked uh, Imam Zuhri, which of the people of Medina have the best knowledge of fiqh? Afqahuhum. He said, Atqahum lillah. Those who have the most taqwa. Faka'anu ashara ila thamrat al fiqh. What he meant was the fruit of this. Taqwa is the, is the fruit of, of internal knowledge. It's not fatawa and aqdiya. And then he said, أَلَا أُنَبِّئُكُمْ بِالْفَقِيهِ كُلَّ الْفَقِيهِ Can I not tell you who a real faqih is? And then they said, indeed, tell us, Ya Rasulullah. He said, مَنْ لَمْ يُقَنَّطَ النَّاسَ مِنْ رَحْمَةِ اللَّهِ Those who don't cause people to despair from the mercy of Allah. But don't make them feel safe from the, the design of Allah. And don't cause them to despair from God's grace. And they don't abandon the Quran desiring some other thing. Those are the real fuqaha. And then uh, Anas ibn Malik said that I should sit with a people and remember Allah, who are remembering Allah from the morning until the evening is better than that I should free four slaves. So he, uh, he explains that, that the problem with fiqh has become associated only with this outward knowledge. The second is ilm. And he said that this is a problem that the ilm that the Prophet ﷺ was talking about was the ilm of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And that's why Ibn Mas'ud, when he said that Omar took nine tenths of knowledge, he wasn't talking about fiqh and these things. He was talking about something much deeper. And so he said that this, this is the real ilm, al-ilm billah. Al-ulama billah, which would obviously include, you know, Allah's His attributes, how He how He works in His creation, these things. And then the third is Tawheed. And he said, This has become to mean Sina'at al-Kalam. It's theology. That's how people understand it. He said that this isn't how it was understood. Tawheed is much deeper than just learning these rules. It's actually perceiving God in creation. It's not in any anthropomorphic or hulul or anything. God is not his creation, but he is actively engaged in every instant in his creation. Allah is sustaining us. He's al-hayur qayyum. La ta'khudu sinatu wa la nawm. He doesn't blink. He doesn't have a, a, a nap. He can't, if, 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 if Allah turned away from creation for one instant, it would all disappear. So the fact that he is actively engaged in his creation, this is real tawheed. It's being aware that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is the, re he is the reality behind all of this. He is al-hayy, the living al-qayyum, the sustainer. One of them said in the dua, to, the, to show us your qayyumiyataka sariyata fi jami' al-makhluqat. Show us how you're sustaining this thing in every instant, all of the creation. Kullu yawm huwa fi sha'an. He's always on, uh, in other words, sustaining his creation. So 
this is, uh, this is real tawheed, and that's why he puts tawheed with tawakkul in the ihya later. He puts them together. Because once you see that everything is in the hands of Allah, you trust in Allah. But if you're lost in the al-hakamu takathuru, takathur, which means yatakatharun, like they're trying to vying to get more and more well. So that has them in lahu. But by ishara, al-hakamu takathuru, multiplicity, takathur, takatharat al-ashya, the multiplicity has you preoccupied. You're in takathur, you're not in tawheed. Hatta zurtum al-maqabir. Until you go to your graves and then you become completely present. So this is an illusion. All of this multiplicity that you're seeing is, it's real. We're not, we're not Hindus. It's real, but the reality of it is that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is sustaining it in every instant. And he created it with haq, bil haq. And so that's real tawheed, it's not this other thing. That's what he's saying. And he said, this leads to tark shikayat al-khalq. If you have real tawheed, you stop complaining about creation. Tark al-ghadab alayhim, you stop hating them. You don't get angry at people. In the same way, it's not, and don't think, this is not Sufi quietism. You know, it's not like, you don't see injustice and you try to right it. You have a different understanding. You see it as ibtila liyabluwakum ayyukum ahsanu amala. He created this situation to test us. How are we going to respond? How are we going to act? But you have to see that Allah is allowing this whole thing to happen. And so you stop complaining. You stop getting angry. وَالرِّضَى وَتَسْلِيمْ لِحُكْمِ اللَّهِ And you become content with the, with, the, with the hukum of Allah. Because you see it for what it is. Allah did this. Allah put, he puts people over us. He, if we're bad, he's, he puts people over us that don't fear us and they have no mercy with us. The Prophet ﷺ said, لا تجعل, you know, he said that, لا تصلت علينا بذنوبنا. Don't put over us because of our sins those that don't have any mercy. And the thing is, you know, you, if you look at places where, where it's worse, often those, it's because those people are actually closer to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Because, إِذَا أَحَبَّ اللَّهُ قَوْمًا أَبْتَلَاهُمْ And so this is where you can't see it as, oh, they're getting what they deserve. It's like, no. We might deserve worse, but he's purifying them in this world. Whereas you're going to get yours later. So you can't see it in some kind of simplistic, oh, they're just getting, you know, again, it's not this kind of karmic thing where, well, the beggar, that's his own fault. We, that's not, we look with ayna shafaqa and rahma, with mercy, and that Allah, the Prophet ﷺ said, Ju'ida adabu ummati fi dunyaha. Allah put the punishment of my ummah in this world. And so those people that are closest are going to get the worst. And also Rafa'ud Darajat, Allah elevates people because it's either a punishment or it's Rafa'ud Darajat. He's elevating them in, in ranks. It's either one or the other. And it's not for us to decide. If you see somebody, a, a Muslim who's in tribulation, it's not for you to decide whether it's takfir al dhanub or it's Rafa'ud Darajat. That's Allah's business. And so he said that that, that is what will happen when you have that. The, uh, and he said one of the fruits of Tawheed is Abu Bakr as-Siddiq when it was said to him he was sick and they said should we get you a doctor he said the doctor made me ill and it's a high maqam Abu Bakr is at a whole other level وَقَوْلٌ آخِرْ لِي أَبُوْ بَكْرِ لَمَّا مَرَضَ قِيلَهُ مَاذَا قَالَ لَكَ الطَّبِيبِ فِي مَرَضِكَ قَالَ لِي إِنِّي فَعَالُ لِمَا أُرِي so they said to Abu Bakr, what did the doctor say? Who saw you? You know, who, you know, what did he say about your sickness? And he said, I do whatever I want. فَعَالُ لِمَا أُرِيبُ That's what Allah says. فَعَالُ لِمَا يُرِيبُ He does whatever he wants. In other words, it's his mulk. Our bodies are his dominion. If he wants to make us sick, he can make us sick. If he wants to keep us well, 
which again doesn't negate us bad, health, staying well, doing all those things. Right? And that's why إِذَا مَرْطُفُوا يَشْفِينَ If I get sick, he heals me. That's what uh, Ibrahim alayhi salam, right? He said the outward of it is to say La ilaha illallah with your tongue. But the inward of it is an yara al-umur kullaha min Allah ru'yatan taqta'u iltifatuhu an al-wasa'id that removes being caught up in the asbab, in the means. وَأَنْ يَعْبُدُهُ عِبَادَةً يُفْرِدُهُ بِهَا فَلَا يَعْبُدُ غَيْرَهُ And he worships him in a way that is completely, the worship is uniquely for him. This is a tawheed that will get you out. This is the tawheed that comes from not following your caprice or your passions. And this is why Allah said, أَفَرَأَيْتَ مِنِ اتَّخَذَ إِلَهُ هَوَاهُ haven't you seen the one who took his passion as his God? And the Prophet ﷺ said, أَبْغَضُ إِلَاهٍ عُبِدَ فِي الْأَرْضِ عِنْدَ اللَّهِ تَعَالَى هُوَ الْهَوَىٰ That the thing that Allah, the, the, the God that is worshipped in the earth that Allah hates the most is desire. Right? The God that's worship, right? Because there's other gods beside God. Not in reality, but in people's consciousness, in their minds. La ilaha bihaqqin. La ilaha yani illallah. So there's no, there's no God bihaqqin in reality except the one true God. But people worship things. People take their nafs as a God. And then he says the next level uh, is is dhikr wa tadkir. And this is misunderstood by a lot of people. So he says now tadkir has become stories, poetry, uh, fantastic uh, utterances, and all these things. And he said, as for stories, it's a bid'ah. Right? And he'll say later, if, you know, if there's sound stories, stories of Sahaba, stories of the Prophet that aren't embellished, then that's, that's part of wow. But a lot of the storytelling that, uh, that arose in the Islamic tradition had fantastical elements to it. Uh, and, and the Qassas was seen as something very negative. Um, once Al-A'mash, uh, one of the great scholars, uh, he went into Basra, and he saw a storyteller telling stories, and the storyteller said, Haddathan al A'mash. So A'mash went into the middle of the circle, and he started plucking his, uh, his underarm. And, and the Sheikh said, the, the Qas, the storyteller said, Ya Sheikh, that's a stahi. Aren't you ashamed? He said, Why should I be ashamed? I'm in Sunnah, and you're telling lies that A'mash told you something. I'm A'mash, and I never told you anything. So th that, there were people that just going around and making things up. Uh, and the biggest liars, Ahmed bin Hanbal said, the biggest liars are the qusas and the suwal, or su'al, the, the, the storytellers and the beggars. Beggars will tell amazing lies. You know, like if you go to Mecca or Medina, yeah, these people will come with these stories and they just, they just spin stories. A lot of them are the same stories because they work together. So they'll have their little bag, it's cut. They'll say they were at Quba and they lost all their money. They're, they're just, they're, they're uh, lying about it. So dhikr is remembering Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And Ata, rahimullah, said, Majlisu dhikrin yukafiru sab'ina majlisan min majaris al lahu. This is a really important statement. Ata, who was one of the great tabi'een, said that a gathering of dhikr, and inshallah this is included in them because we're uh, in remembrance of Allah and his deen, that a gathering of dhikr will, will expiate 70 gatherings of entertainment, lahu. And we need this now because so many people sit in front, you know, people can't read the Quran very long, but they can sit, watch a movie for two hours, no problem. You know, but a lecture for two hours, they can't sit through it. Right? Knowledge, 
things like this. They don't. So he's saying to do that, um, and then he Ahmed bin Hanbal said, "Ma ahwaj al nas ila qasin sadiq." People need truthful storytellers. You know, because stories is part of our tradition, the Quran. Uh, that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gave us ahsan al-qasas, the best stories. So he says, if it's from the Prophet's stories, uh, if he's giving a sound riwayah, the Prophet told, told stories. He told the story of the three men. One was bald, one had leprosy, one was blind, and the angel came in the form. That's in Sahih Muslim. So the Prophet وسلم, told stories. Stories are very useful, but the danger is... Uh, the, these embellished stories. And then Ash'ar, he warns about that too much. Uh, and and it was Shu'ara, Itba'ahum uh, al they're followed by the Itba'ahum uh, al Alam tara annahum fi kulli wadin yahimun, wandering about, yaquruna ma la yafa'loon. And then he talks about the Shatahat. And the Shatahat are things that some of the uh, excessive Sufis uh, would say. Um, Outrageous statements, um, and he talks about two different kinds. One that's uh, false claims, you know. And, and you should always, if you see people that start telling you they saw the prophet in a dream or this, that, or that, that's always red flags. It's, they're either ignorant or they're uh, a con artist. And. One of my favorite, um, when I was studying Arabic literature, one of my favorite writers was uh, Badi'u Zaman al-Hamadani, who wrote uh, Maqamat. And he had a character in there, the main character, Abu al-Fatih al-Iskandari. And he was a, basically a religious charlatan. And I thought it was very interesting. Like, at the time, I didn't really, I didn't think about it in that way that I came to later realize that he was really warning people about religious charlatans, because there's a lot of them out there. And religion, because people, it's very hard for people to imagine somebody lying to them about God or about the Prophet, or, but people do it. There are a lot of liars out there. And there's a lot of people just, they're out to get your money, and they'll come with all these stories, and, and also beware of people that build you up and, and uh, tell you, you know, you're supposed to, you know, you don't throw dirt in their face. You know, there's a hadith. <laughs> it's actually you pick it up. If somebody's praising you, the sunnah was to pick it up and then just do that. In other words, I'm dust. You know, it's like I'm nothing. You know, that's what you're doing. It's, it's, it's just to remind them and yourself, I'm nothing, just dust. Zygote that got out of control. Right. And he said that this fen, this art form, is has great harm for common people. You know, and, and so making false claims, you can fool people, so especially simple village people, you know, the peer. There's, there's all these peers that go, and they're simple people. They charge money. They write them the, the uh, you know, like the hijab. They call it, what do they call it in Pakistan? Uh, Ta'weez. You know, they write ta'weez, charge them money. The only ta'weez you need is qura'udu barabir faraq and qura'udu barabir nas. That's, teach people that. That's all they need. They don't need it. You don't need to wear anything. It's permissible to wear something from the Quran. The Prophet, uh, there's a riwayat, put things on Hassan and Hussein. Most of that is for people that have a lot of waswasa. Sometimes it helps them psychologically. It's like a, it's like a placebo. You know, it'll help them, uh, you know, just calm them down. And we seek refuge with karimati da'i tammati. Uh, you know, so it's not, it's not saying that, that it's not me. But Allah is the protector. The, the hijab will not protect you. Allah is the protector. So uh, that's important to remember that.
And then he said that there's a type of uh, shatah that's just, it's almost like a madness. And he said that they'll say some things that are confusing. Um, I'm aware of the time. I want to get through this. And then finally, uh, he goes into something really important, which is about the the bataniya and uh, in this area that, you know, the, the, the occultists, they want to destroy Sharia, and they want to destroy it through false interpretations. And so this is some of the, the uh, you know, the extreme Sufis um, that uh, argued that Sharia wasn't necessary for them. I mean, you had that. Uh, and unfortunately, every group has uh, people that go astray like that. And then finally, the last word that he goes into is uh, hikmah. And the hikmah is wisdom. And the hakim, he said, can mean a tabib, a doctor, a sha'ir, a poet, a munajim, an astronomer. Uh, and he said even the people that do like, they do lottery are, are called uh, uh, So he said that hikmah, woman you tell hikmah tafaqad utiya khairan kathira. Those that are given wisdom have been given great knowledge. Kerimatu min al hikmati yata'alamu har rajulu khairu lahum min al dunya wa ma fiha. To learn a hikmah uh, and then uh, is better than the world and what's in it. And so hikam can be like aphorisms. Uh, much of the hadith, I mean, it's all hikmah. Uh, but the hikmah is the opposite of uh, like abath, you know, meaninglessness. Hikmah is wisdom, and it's the highest of those intellectual virtues, the hikmah. The Prophet ﷺ, uh, spoke uh, in pure Wisdom, all of his sayings are wise. And Ibn Qayyim al Jawziyah has a very important statement. And every Muslim should know this because it's like a standard to judge your faith. Ibn Qayyim al Jawziyah said, Al Islam hikmatun kulluha, wa rahmatun kulluha, wa maslahatun kulluha, wa adrun kulluha. Right? So the, he said the sharia, shari'atullah, the sharia, is hikmah. All of sharia is hikmah. And all of sharia is rahmah. And all of sharia is maslaha. And all of sharia is justice. So he said, فَإِذَا انْتَقَرَتْ مِنَ الْحِكْمَةِ إِلَى الْعَبَثِ If it goes from wisdom to foolishness, it's not from the sharia. إِذَا انْتَقَرَتْ مِنَ الْرَحْمَةِ uh, if it goes from mercy to cruelty, it's not from the sharia. If it goes from welfare to harm, it's not from the sharia. If it goes from what's just to what's unjust, it's not from sharia. And that's a really good standard for people just to use your common sense about things. Because if it doesn't seem right, it's probably not right. So he says, this is what has happened. And he, he blames it on what he calls ulama as And he says, now listen to this. All of this is min talbisati ulama as All of this is from these bad ulama. فَإِنَّ شَرَّهُمْ أَعْظَمُ عَلَى الدِّينِ مِنْ شَرَّ الشَّيَاطِينِ إِذَا الشَّيَطَانُ بِوَاسِطَتِهِمْ يَتَذَرَّعُوا إِلَى إِنْتِزَاعِ الدِّينِ مِنْ قُلُوبِ الْخَلْقِ وَلِهَذَا لَمَّا سُئِلَ رَسُولُ اللَّهِ صَلَّى اللَّهُ عَلَيْهِ وَسَلَّمَ عَنْ شَرَّ الْخَلْقِ أَبَى وَقَالَ اللَّهُمَّ غَفْرَ حَتَّى كُرِّيرَ عَلَيْهِ ثُمَّ قَالَ هُمْ عُلَمَاءُ السُّوءِ And the Prophet ﷺ was asked, uh, he said, that all of this comes from the bad ulama. 
And he said, they're worse for this religion than the, the demons. In fact, he said, shaitan, through them, has been able to remove the religion from the hearts of people. You can see why they burnt his book. <laughs> and then he said, and this is why the Prophet ﷺ, when he was asked, who are the worst people? He refused to answer initially. And they kept asking him until finally he said, ulama usu. Bad ulama. فَقَدْ عَرَفْتَ الْعِلْمِ الْمَحْمُودِ وَالْمَذْمُومِ Now you know what's praiseworthy and what's blameworthy. إِلَيْكَ الْخِيرَةُ فِي أَنْ تَنْظَرْ لِنَفْسِكَ Now you have the choice. Look for yourself. Who do you want to follow? The Salaf? Or do you want to go the way of this deluded people? Because the Salaf, their knowledges have disappeared. And what people are following, most of it is مُبْتَدَعٌ muhdath. It's all bid'ah and innovated. وَقَدْ صَحَّ قَوْلُ رَسُولِ اللَّهِ صَلَّى اللَّهِ وَسَلَّمَ بَدَأ الْإِسْلَامُ غَرِيبًا I mean, this is a thousand years ago, people. And it's true what the Prophet ﷺ said. Islam began as a strange thing. وَسَيَعُودُ غَرِيبًا كَمَا بَدَأَ And it's going to return as a strange thing. فَطُوبَ لِلْغُرَبَاء Blessed are the strangers. فَقِيلَ مَنَ الْغُرَبَاءُ يَا رَسُولَ اللَّهِ who are the strangers, O Messenger of Allah? Those who rectify what people have corrupted from my way. And those who bring to life, that's why he called it Ihya, those who bring to life what people have caused to die from my way. الغرباء ناس قليل صالحون بين ناس كثيرا من يبغضهم أكثر ممن يحبهم in another riwayah that Ahmed relates the strangers are a few people who are righteous amongst many people those that don't like them are more than those that like them وقد صارت تلك العلوم غريبة all these sciences have become strange يمقت ذاكرها if you remind people of them they don't like you ولذلك قال الثوري رحمه الله إِذَا رَأَيْتَ العالم كثير الأصدقاء فعلم أنه مخلط. This is why a Thawri said, if you see an alim that's got a lot of friends, you should know he's mixing things. لِأَنَّهُ إِنَّ تَقَبِ الْحَقِّ أَبْغَضُوا Because if he speaks the truth, people aren't going to like to hear it. And then he goes about the, the, uh, the amount of knowledge that you should learn from these. And he basically just says that the most important knowledge is to learn... Oh, the, I'll, I'll finish this, you know, because this is actually really important. He says it's very important to focus on what you need. And, and I would recommend reading Ayyuh al-Walad, because he wrote that at the end of his life. It's a very important book, because he, he just says what... It, and this is a man who mastered all the sciences of his time. He was, a, he was an engineer, he knew handasa, he knew medicine. He, he had it all, really. The man was an absolute, one of the great human geniuses in, in history. So this is a man who spent his life mastering everything. And he was, of all people, he is, is I think, the most trustworthy in this assessment. He said, don't waste your life learning a lot of useless information. Learn Arabic grammar in what you need to understand the Book of Allah and the Sunnah of the Prophet. Don't spend your life learning grammar. He said it's a waste of your life. Your time is precious. And then he said don't spend your life uh, learning all the details and khilafat and all these things. Learn what you need to get to your Lord. Um, and so what he said that people love... Uh, he said, for theology, all you need is my book, Al-I'tiqad fil I'tiqad. And that's the second book in the Ihya. So it's 100 pages. That's all, he said, that's all you need. You don't need any more than that. He said, don't go deep into these things. He said that, uh, don't go into Jadal. Now this is really important, I'll end with this. He said, you can benefit people as long as fanaticism hasn't got hold of them. 
Did you get that? Listen to this. None of this will benefit with common people if ta'asub has gotten hold of them. Fanaticism. أَمَّا الْمُبْتِدَعْ بَعْدًا يَعْلَمْ مِنَ الْجَدْرِ وَلَوْ شَيْءًا يَسِيرًا فَقَلَّ مَا يَنْفَعُ مَعُهُ الْكَلَامِ once a mubtidi' gets hold of dialectic, argumentation, you can't, there's nothing you could do to benefit him. Even if you beat him in your argument, he won't leave his way. Why? He said, a common person, you can bring him back if, if you have a good argument. As long as the fanaticism hasn't got hold of him. Once it gets hold of him, we have to despair from them. And then he said, if a ta'asubu sababun al aqaida fin nafus, fanaticism is one of the means by which things become deeply embedded in, in, in a person's uh, personality. He said, this is one of the hallmarks of bad ulama. فَإِنَّهُمْ يُبَارِغُونَ فِي التَّعَصُبْ لِلْحَقِّ They exaggerate their fanaticism for the truth. وَيَنْظُرُونَ إِلَى الْمُخَالِفِينَ بِعَيْنَ الْإِزْدِرَاءِ وَالْإِسْتَحْقَارِ And they look at anybody that disagrees with them as being contemptible and low. فَيَنْبَعِثُ مِنْهُمْ الدَّوَاعِ بِالْمُكَافَأَةِ وَالْمُقَابَلَةِ وَتَتَوَفَّرُ بَوَاعِذُهُمْ عَلَى الطَّرَبِ نُصْرَةَ الْبَاطِ support batil in this fanaticism. And then, because they now they're, they're attributed to this school or whatever they're in, he said, they become, it becomes very strong in them. And then he says, had they come, if they came with gentleness, with kindness, with, with a lack of harshness, taking people privately, not, not saying it openly, condemning them openly, you're this and you're that. and No, just take them aside and give them good advice. He said, not with your fanaticism and your I, I'm the only way and your belittling and your contemptibility towards them. They would have been successful. Now, here's the key. All right, this is the key. Now, he's spilling a big secret right here. ولكن لما كان الجاه لا يقوم إلا بالاستتباع when stature and prominence only comes from having a lot of followers, right? How many you have on your Twitter, right? When, when oh, he's got two million. Well, Lady Gaga's got twenty-two million. You know. It's no big deal, right? But those people that want lots of followers, لا يستميل الأتباع مثل التعصب واللعن والشتم للخصوم. Nothing will give you followers better than being a fanatic, cursing others, attacking others, right? That's how you get your followers. اتخذوا التعصب عادتهم وآلتهم. They took this fanaticism as their habit and their tool. And they called it defending the religion. And defending the Muslims. But in reality, they've destroyed the people. أما الخلافيات التي أحدثت في هذه العصارة المتأخرة وأبدع فيها من التحريرات والتصنيفات ومن مجادلات ما لم يعهد مثلها في السلف As for all these differences that they brought forward in these later ages and, 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 and they have all these books and all these arguments and all these things that the salaf didn't do فإياك أن تحوم حولها Woe unto you that you should start circulating around these things. Avoid it like you avoid deadly poison. Because it's a disease that will never be cured. Right? Now, and we'll end here. Maybe some people will say, Ah, people are just ignorant. They're enemies of things that they're ignorant of. Like, in other words, you're just saying this because you don't really know the situation. Like, we're defending the religion, blah, blah, blah. 
فلا تظنن ذلك Don't think that فعلى الخبير سقط You have found the expert فاقبل هذه النصيحة Accept this sound advice ممن ضيع العمر فيه زمانة From a man who wasted a good portion of his life in this very thing I'm talking about وقد زاد فيه على الأولين تصنيفا وتحقيقا وجدلا وبيانا and I, and I did it better than the people before me in my writing, in my rigor, in my dialectic, and in my elucidation. I mean, he's saying it right there. I was the best at this. I knew it better than anybody. So take this. ثُمَّ أَلْهَمَهُ Allah. I mean, he's talking in third person out of humility. And then God inspired him رُشْتَهُ وَأَطْلَعُهُ عَلَىٰ عَيْبِهِ And showed him his own faults. فَهَجَرَهُ وَاشْتَغَرَ بِنَفْسِهِ So he abandoned this way. And he began preoccupied with his own heart. Don't be deluded by people that say, oh, fatwa is the basis of our religion, and you only know it if you know all these differences. Anyway, he goes on. But that, that's a really important point. He said, be safe from these demons. And, and guard yourself. Just shayateen al jins are easy to handle. He's saying, really guard yourself from the human demons. They've given a vacation to the jinn. By leading people astray. They're doing a much better job at it. So, Allahu <laughs> Akbar. Subhanakum wa bihamdika. Shadu an la ilaha illa anta astaghfiruk wa atubu ilayk. This is a, you know, I mean, this is it. It's our crisis. Prophet said, Ida ra'ita shuhan muta'an wa dunya mu'tharatan wa ijaba kulli di ra'in bi ra'i. Fa'alayka bi khasati nafsika. لا يضرك من ضل. If you see world, this world preferred over the next world. If you see uh, the uh, people covetous and no longer generous with what God's given them, and you see every opinionated person amazed at their own opinion. It's called Twitter, folks. If you see every opinionated person amazed at their own opinion, how clever they are. How much they have to share with the world. You know, once you see that, the Prophet said, take care of your own soul. So, I say, oh, this is quietism. You're abandoning haq. Yeah, good luck. I mean, we've got majanin out there. This is mad. This place has gone mad. It's gone mad. You can't, you can't even talk to people anymore. Huh? Were you going to say something? I know. I know. Go ahead. Fadda. Subhanakallah wa bihamdika. Shadu an la ilaha illa anta astaghfiruka wa tubu ilaik. Jazakumullah